We're now ready to begin. And I'm going to begin this afternoon with the reading of the beautiful 23rd Psalm. Mizmola Davi, Adonai Roi Loech Zar Ben Odeshi Yar Bitzaini, Almei Menuchod Yenahaleini, Nafshi Yeshovei Yancheni V'Magrei Tzedek Leman Shemo, Gam Ki Alech B'Geitz Al Mavet Lo Ira Ra Ki Ata Yimadi, Shiv Techa Umisham Techa Hema Yenachamuni, Ta'aroch Levanai Shochan Neged Sorerai, Dishante V'Shemen Roshi Kosir Revaya. Ach tovach esigir dufuni, kol yamei chayai, v'shavti bevet Adonai le'orech yamin. The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want. He has me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He guides me on paths of righteousness. He revives my soul for the sake of His glory. Though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no harm, for You are with me. Your staff and your rod do comfort me. You set a table inside of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall abide in the house of the Lord forever. My friends, on an occasion like this, I find myself becoming unusually contemplative. Whenever I'm asked to eulogize anyone, I'm always mindful that I'm speaking about a human being who lived a life with hopes and dreams, successes and failures, and it is always my responsibility and privilege to paint a picture that can somehow capture the breadth and scope of that person's life. But the challenge and the sense of responsibility becomes even more. I feel when I'm dealing with a human being who, like Avram Moskowitz, who experienced a life that began on one side of the world and through numerous steps in between ended up on the other, a man who endured and survived the rigors and pain of a Nazi concentration camp, yet at the same time a man who never lost his sense of purpose and his desire to rebuild a life from the ashes of his past. To call a man like Avram a survivor is too simple. I like how Stan put it. Avram was an epic survivor. When you or I might have given up, said enough already, Avram pushed on. And today, in remembering this remarkable man, we also come to honor him. To honor him for being, in so many ways, a role model for tenacity, for endurance, for perseverance. For having survived a world of hate and created a family that's filled with such love, Avram's world journey began 90 years ago in Kilship, Poland, where he was born to Ari and Chaya. He came from a religious family where both his grandfather and great grandfather were distinguished rabbis. When Avram was young, his parents decided to move to the much larger Jewish community of Lodz, where life was good. Traditional and predictable, until it wasn't. Soon after the outbreak of World War II, the Nazis converged upon Lodz and pushed the entire Jewish community, including his parents and his brother, into a ghetto. Because Avram had blonde hair and blue eyes, it was easy for him to sneak out of the ghetto and walk among poles, undetected, as he collected food to sneak back to his family. He was caught several times, but miraculously, he always escaped. One day, the Germans came into Lodz and created two lines. His mother and his brother Herschel were sent to one line. Avram and his father were put in another. But his father couldn't bear being separated from his wife, so he sneaked into the line with her. That line, tragically, was sent to its death. The line in which Avram now stood alone was sent to Buchenwald to work in a munitions factory making arms for the German army. Because of his age, he was only 14, and his strength and good health, he survived three years in Buchenwald. He was also lucky. One of the German overseers at the camp took a liking to young Avram, 
and saw that he got a little extra bread. Those additional calories may well have contributed to keeping little Morris, as the German officer called him, alive until the war's end. On April 11, 1945, Wilkenwald was the first camp liberated by the American forces, and Avram was a free young man. At the time of his liberation, he was nothing more than skin and bones, but he was alive. Feeding him regular food would have killed him, so he was placed in a hospital in Stuttgart, Germany, where his diet gradually was brought to normal. Once he left the hospital, he had thoughts of returning to Poland to see who, if anyone, in his extended family might have survived. But the reports from Poland were ominous. Even after the war, Jews were still being murdered by Poles. It was too dangerous for Jews to go back. Avram turned back and went to work helping the American forces create a displaced German, a displaced Jewish center at Stuttgart. He went to France to help smuggle orphaned Jewish children to a new kibbutz in Israel, Netzer Sereni, which had been founded by survivors of Buchenwald to give new lives to survivors from Europe. Like many Holocaust survivors, Avram did not want to stay in Europe any longer than necessary. Though he went to Israel several times with the orphaned children, his personal dream was to go to the States but entry into America was still tightly restricted. When he discovered that family which had escaped Poland before the war was living in Mexico, they contacted each other and arranged for Avram to move there. Even that was an arduous journey. He had to go from Germany to the Netherlands, to Iceland, to Curacao, and Cu Curacao? Curacao, excuse me, of course, and Cuba. And finally, he made his way to Mexico City. It was 1948 when he arrived. Avram was now 23. Though he lived in Mexico for nearly two decades, in truth, he never liked it. It was foreign to the world he had left behind. Even so, he was determined to start a new life for himself. And he ended up becoming a manufacturer of leather jackets, which he designed. He mastered Spanish and made himself comfortable in his newly adopted land. The only thing he was missing was a wife. <laughs> it turned out there was a young, lovely young lady he had seen at the Jewish Community Center named Esther Eichner. Esther had a close friend who was in love with a close friend of Avram. Esther's friend wouldn't dare go out on a date alone, so she asked Esther to join her and Avram became Esther's date. I'm not sure what happened to Esther's friend and Avner's friend. <laughs> but we do know what happened to Avner and Esther. Their first date was in January, and they were married in August by not one, but four rabbis. And for 61 years, they enjoyed an enduring and truly wonderful marriage. Soon the children came, three girls, Frida, Helen, and then Fega, who later was Faye. <laughs> Esther's family was very prominent in Mexico City, and life there was good. But Avram wanted to move to the United States still, and he wasn't prepared to relinquish his long-held dream. Esther thought that with their lovely home and three children, things were fine as they were. But when Avram reiterated his desire to move, she went to her father and cried. Her father told her not to worry. It would take Avram years to get his papers processed. It'd be next to impossible to get into the United States. Dry your tears, Esther's father said. It'll never happen. Three months later, papers in hand. <laughs> Avram, Esther, and the whole mishpacha made their way across the border to Brownsville, Texas where Avram and Esther would live together. Avram loved Brownsville, Texas, and the United States in that order. There he opened an electronics store, a la Radio Shack, with all kinds of imported electronics like TVs, CB radios, and the like. In pre-Best Buy days, Avram's store was a big hit in Brownsville, and he did well until the devaluation of the peso led to his decision ultimately to retire. 
In Brownsville, Avram was an avid sports fan, enjoyed spending time watching boxing and soccer on TV. He also enjoyed his weekly visits to the Central Post Office in Brownsville, Texas, <laughs> where he was a real big shot. Everyone knew him, and he was welcomed as a good friend to all, by all. He became an avid shoe collector and possessed what his family lovingly described as the largest shoe collection in all of the state of Texas. Avram and Esther were both very involved in the Jewish community there. Avram enjoyed being a member of B'nai B'rith. He loved to read the Yiddish version of the Jewish Forward and to listen to Yiddish recordings of old world music and Chazanut. He and Esther loved crossing the border to dine in Madame Morris. They loved dancing, going to movies, and the theater. He loved swimming in the Gulf. Esther and Avram enjoyed a wonderful life together where he worked hard, while Esther worked hard at home, taking care of the house and their three growing daughters. Each of the children enjoyed a special relationship with their father. Though their dad was a hard worker who spent six days each week in his store, he still was there for his girls. When the girls married, Avram welcomed Stuart, Stan, and Ed into the family with love. When the grandchildren were born, Gabe, Joey, Sean, Catherine, Sam, and Alex, they became his truest joys. He would drive up to Houston with Esther to watch his grandsons play soccer and to give them tips on how to improve their game. Though he never spoke about his Holocaust experiences with his own children, he did address the subject with his grandkids. It was important for them to know, he felt, for the next generation to never forget what happened. When he and Esther came to Houston, Avram would go off going with the whole family to pick up bagels at the bagel shop and then to go to Kenny and Ziggy's. When the grandkids grew older and Aaron and Emily joined the family, he welcomed them into his home and heart as well. And of course, when Benjamin was born just recently, Avram's world was complete. A great grandson for a man who 70 years earlier might have thought his life was over. When the first International Holocaust Survivors Gathering was convened in Israel, Avram and Esther chose to go. However, he resolved to never return to Europe, despite numerous invitations to do so. It had been the scene of too much loss, too much tragedy. He would never go. Though he had built a wonderful and beautiful night life for himself, first in Mexico and then in America, his memories of the war and his years in Buchenwald continued to plague him. In the last years of his life, the war kept coming back to him. He began reliving it in his mind. The only thing that gave him peace was when he got to see his girls, his grandkids and Benjamin and the whole family. They were able to turn his thoughts away from the past, if only for a while, and put a beautiful smile on his face. His Avram was an amazing man who lived and survived the most terrible chapter in human history. No human being could live through half of what he lived through and emerge unscathed. Throughout his life, he faced numerous life-threatening diseases when his family was told to expect the end. But Avram survived, not once, but many times. Survived to help orphan Jewish children make new lives in Israel. Survived to start a new life in Mexico and then America. Survived to raise three beautiful daughters and watch his family blossom and grow. Survived to hold a great-grandchild in his aging arms. Yes, Avram was indeed an epic survivor. And we will always cherish the life that out of the ashes of Europe gave new life to a grateful family. Zichrono Bracha, may his memory ever be for a blessing. Amen. I'm now going to call upon his grandson, Sean, to speak for all the grandchildren. Um, I'm quite certain that 
no one has ever been guilty of having ever forgotten ever meeting my Zadie. My Zadie had this unique trait in him that endured everybody around him to love him and drew them to him. It's impossible for me to articulate that there was some quality to him, some skill, some characteristic about him. I don't know if it was the twinkle in his eye or his smile or the warmth you felt when you walked into the room that he made you feel as though you were the most important person in the world that drew people to him and that no matter what, people loved him. Um, those of us who knew him best and uh, even those of us who uh, only spent a night with him in the, in the hospital could tell you that at times my Zadie could be a difficult person. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he was very, very set in his ways and had a personality that would dominate whichever conversation that he was in, whichever room that he was taking place in, that made himself the center of attention. And no matter how much he disregarded whatever advice he should take or ignored common sense, he endured and he survived. And in his defense, he had a very successful life and it seemed to work out very well for him. And I wouldn't go so far as to say that there is a method to his madness. Um, my, my brother and my, my father might you know, disagree with some of his you know, medical decisions, but what I think that really enabled him to survive for as long as he did was that he possessed such a strength and willpower. He was the strongest person that I had ever met. His entire life story was one continuous against the odds, overcoming everything imaginable that would ever life threw his way and came out on the other side. To be quite honest, um, I never really thought that I would see this day. I would joke with my parents that, my, that he would outlive us all. And uh, it was only slightly tongue-in-cheek. I, I, I really, truly, and honestly believe that, that he could overcome truly anything but um that day is here um, Zadie you did not have an easy life but may there now be finally peace upon you a peace that you so rightfully deserve may all the pain and suffering that you endured for so long be eternally laid to rest and may your persevering spirit, your ruach, and your soul, your neshama, forever live in us, in your descendants, who, through your power, through your strength, and your love, we are here today. So thank you, Zadie. We love you. Thank you, Sean. Your Zadie would have been deeply touched if you and your cousin standing up here singing his praises today. I'm now going to ask everyone to please rise for the memorial prayer. El Malay Rahamin Shokhain Bamaromin. Amit se menucha nebora tacher can pay hashikina. The my lord kiroshim with the horib is a hara kirama sirin. Et nishmat afar ham bet ari bechaya. Shahalach lo la mo began aim to him and uchato. Ana bala rachamin. Hasti rehu besaitri can a fecha la ola mean. Utsroor bisoracha yim et nishmato. Adonai hu nachalato. O God, exalted and full of compassion, grant perfect peace in your sheltering presence among the holy and pure to the soul of our beloved Abraham Moskowitz, who has gone now to his eternal home. Dear God, we ask you, remember all the worthy and righteous deeds this good man performed in the land of the living. May his soul be bound up in the bond of life eternal. May he ever rest in peace. 
and let us say, oh, you may be seated. Adonai, Adonai, Urachum Bechanun. The Lord our God is a compassionate God. He understands our pain and he shares our sorrow. The dust returns to the earth as it was, but the spirit goes back to God who gave it. What we put away are only the earthly material remains of the one we loved and cherished. What has been most precious to us never dies but continues to bless and inspire us along the paths of life we tread. Their good name is a crown that never fades. Their good life is a priceless memory to all their dear ones and to all of us. Receive in mercy and loving kindness, O Lord, the soul of our departed, Avraham ben Ari Vachaya. Grant him that everlasting peace and bliss which are our portion in the world to come. May we all be given the strength, the courage, and the faith to be worthy of life and of the memory of those we love. Amen. Amen. My friends, following our service, the family will be returning to Stan and Helen's home at 4716 Willow in Bel Air, where Shiva Minyanin will take place tonight and on Sunday night. Both services will be at 6 o'clock, and your presence at one or both of those memorial services will be most welcome and appreciated. Our tradition teaches that there are many things we can ask others to help us do when we say farewell to our loved ones at a time such as this. But there's one thing we will do ourselves. We will put the first handfuls of earth upon the grave of our loved one. And with those handfuls of earth, also send our heartfelt prayers for his safe flight to Gan Eden, his safe flight into the hands of our loving God. I'm going to begin by inviting the immediate family members to step forward, and afterwards, others will have the opportunity as well. I'm now going to ask the mourning family to please rise, join with me as together we recite the mourner's cottage for the first time in loving memory of our father and our husband. Yitkadal v'yitkadash shamei rabah Be'alma divara kirute be'almi ma'chute Echaye chon uv'yom echon uv'chaye d'cho b'ek Yisrael Ba'agala uv'izman kari v'yimeru amen Yehei shamei rabah mevorach le'olam olobay omaya Yitbarach v'yishtabach v'yitpar v'yitromam v'yitnase V'yitadar v'yitale v'yitalau shamei d'kudusha v'yichu Eila miko birchata v'shirata Tush birchata v'nechemata Dam iran be'alma v'yimeru amei Yehei shalama rabah v'neshamaya V'chayim malenu v'al kol Yisrael v'yimeru amei Ose shalom b'mromav the family may be seated and others who would like to continue with the covering of the grave are now welcome to do so. And this will conclude our service here this afternoon.